Sooner than I expected, I found my first connection whilst on the internet. An eccentric toy collector, well-renowned by millions on YouTube, Tim Rowett. Spurred by intrigue, I researched into him further and came across an article where he disclosed that previous philosophical endeavours almost led to his suicide in search for the truth. This made me question his intention to become the owner of 25,000 toys, as well as develop his fascination for the ephemeral. I felt I had to pursue him. With no email, he was hard to track down, but in a video of his, I stumbled across his phone and address, and discovered that he lives ten minutes from me. After some failed attempts of calling him, I decided to hand deliver a letter to him with my number on, and we arranged to meet that weekend. So what, what, what would you say your main kind of theme of, of, of toys are? Oh, something that makes you just go, wow. Yeah. Or oh, wicked, this girl, cool man. <laughs> that means it's not going to be Lego, because uh, that's a sensible thing that parents should buy for their kids, because they'll, you know, they'll mm. take it a long time. Whereas this sort of stuff is very, very ephemeral, very brief. Mm. And you see what? Wow. And then you yeah. know, they, they it. Well, well, it's, it's a desire to entertain people. Uh, I've always got that like, like an actor's on us. Mm. I love entertaining people. After asking about his past, he seemed understandably reluctant to open up about it to a stranger he'd never met before, which I noticed at the time, but it led to our conversation come to a close. I think I became too caught up with this idealised character I imagined before meeting him, and as a result was quite disheartened at understanding that after my interview with him. Nevertheless, I learnt that his life was a simple one. Alone in a flat near the river, accompanied by his shelves of toys and a radio. By adopting this theme of curiosity and childlike wonder, I came across a one-of-a-kind shop, El Ingenio, whilst in Barcelona, selling oversized masks, puppets and novelties. It seemed like a perfect place to investigate. There, I met Leia, who has kept the shop running after her family of magicians acquired it before it was about to liquidate last year. Whilst giving me a tour of the shop, and showing me toys she played with as a child, I told her about my project, and she was enthusiastic for me to interview her and film the following day. Yeah, this is the first picture of these giants, the, the, are the same, year 54. 1954. Uh, 1954. We had built a good rapport between us, and she happily translated questions I asked their artisan painter. In between her running back and forth working at the till and talking to me, I decided to film in the back of shop. During these moments, it created a disconnect between me and the environment which I feel translated into my footage. Leia was curious to know what role El Ingenio would play in my project, to which I asked her to describe serendipity, as there is no word for it in Spanish. I, I call it destiny, just destiny and I explain it a little bit, like it's a cycle of life where everybody is, and everything is related, mm. that means that you can meet somebody again mm. even you want you don't want him to see anymore because it's meant to be, and that's, yeah. that's how I explain it a little bit, but yeah. because we don't have a real word really? for that, I call it destiny, but it's mm. not exactly destiny. Just before I left, she mentioned something quite prominent. When I started working for the sh uh, in the shop last summer, I, I felt I, I, I was meant to be here because it suits with my personality. Because, uh, and my friends and everybody who knows me that uh, say that I really look very happy in here. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I found that the shop was quite bizarre, and it seemed like a place that encouraged people to escape in and immerse themselves in its banality. After being led by my curiosity to El Ingenio following my encounter with Tim, I was beginning to see certain themes emerging and connections between them. I considered recontacting Tim again to film him. After trying so hard to track him down, I didn't want to just give up on him. I tried calling him to arrange a time to meet, but was unprepared when it went to voicemail. Uh, 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 playing with some toys and things, if that's 
if that's possible, um, as I've spoken to my tutors and uh, uh, they and me are, are really happy with how my project's going and that's um, thanks to you really. So. Unfortunately, Tim did not get back to me, so I had to move my project forward another way. Whilst on a walk, I decided to revisit a place from my childhood, the London Museum of Water and Steam in Brentford. I was able to gain access to film there after speaking to the head of education, whose brothers by coincidence go to Ravensbourne. She was very eager to help, and was interested in my suggestion to interview the elderly volunteers there and record their stories. In doing so, I believed that reflecting on their past would progress my story. What introduced them to the museum, and why did they pursue it? There, I was introduced to Ron, a charismatic and cheerful man who has been there for 40 years. Our conversation led him to reminisce about how his life has revolved around the museum. What would your childhood self say to you? My childhood self <coughs> was interested in steam locomotives from the age of one, at which stage I'd been carried across the footbridge of Liverpool Street Station, the locomotive underneath reached its hurting pressure, lifted its safety valves, blew off steam, and I yelled. I yelled all the way to Whitham, which is about 40 miles out, on a, on a steam train with knee-to-knee uh, -knee compartments, so you couldn't get out. Uh, my poor mother, what she went through on that journey. And then it, it all, all over the footbridge and onto the Malden train as well. What introduced you to steam engines? And that dude. That was. <laughs> yeah, I was scared of it. <laughs> Ron then introduced me to some of the other volunteers, and I first spoke to Noel, who drives many of the engines there. This is the 90-inch engine, which I run at 3 o'clock. That's the pin is already out, so I need to open it and let, which is there, and Line some warming steam onto it. things in life. A girlfriend brought me here so I, I preferred the museum to the girlfriend so she disappeared and I stayed working at the museum as a volunteer. She moved on to somebody else and uh, I'm still here. <laughs> I soon began to see how the museum is a place built from memories that bring those who work there together. When I spent my first because in those days you didn't have I'm a I'm sorry, I've got to cut you off. You've run out of battery. No, no, no. I didn't, or wasn't recording sound. <laughs> so, uh, oh, there, right. It's going to sound awfully still the second time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, right. So how did I get involved with the London <laughs> Museum of Water and Steam? No, the Cubridge, Cubridge Steam Museum, as it was then. And the answer is, um, I'd just been ditched by a woman. And uh, so I had some, needed something to do at the weekends instead of sitting at home sobbing into my beer. So I came down here. Um, I'd always been interested in industrial archaeology, excavated various sites and so on. And uh, it seemed to be an interesting possibility. It seemed it was not only a place to reminisce, but also somewhere that allowed its volunteers to overcome particular sadness they'd encountered elsewhere. Me nostalgic. Ho, ho, ho. It, it, it's written through the middle of me like a stick of Blackpool rock, I think. Nostalgia. Yeah, very nostalgic guy. At this point, I reached a dilemma as a filmmaker, but thought against being a fly on the wall and wanted to participate with what was going on around me. I used to be able to lift this up quite easily, but I'm struggling nowadays. Oh, 
haven't got a timber. Do you need a hand? I would love a hand, please, yeah. yeah. Um, Oh, there you go. That's what I need to know. You might wish to get a shot of that, but that's still in the tank. No, 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 it's very heavy. Thank you. Gosh, yeah. That's the, um, the big round thing in front of you is a delivery valve, and then you can see a handle, which is just a bypass valve, and right. that allows the water that we're pumping to go back into the tank. So the load on the engine is that gate valve just being partly open. In retrospect, I've come to realise that this project was a search for people who have approached and overcome hurdles in their lives, similar to that which I've encountered during my process. They have done so by finding the environment that has relieved them of the life they used to live almost an escape from the fast world that once consumed them. With this film, I've come to understand that serendipity isn't just for those with luck on their side, but actually for when people have gone through hardship and struggle before the happy accident unveils itself. You happy?